so um, I'm Ben Matthews. Um, I'm a watershed restoration uh, scientist with the Nature Conservancy. I work uh, with Josh uh, doing a lot of this work right here in the home state of Maine. Um, and I'm very excited that everyone was here to see uh, this wonderful video that uh, Josh put in a ton of work with a lot of partners uh, to, to put together to try to get this message out to everyone. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, answer any questions that you guys have. I focus a lot of my work um, on um, dam removals in the state of Maine and then also something that was mentioned in this um, uh, in, the, in the video, but a, a lot about uh, culvert and road stream crossings, which are just as much a problem as dams for fish getting to um, the areas that they need to to spawn. I, I like to think of it in terms of the vascular system was mentioned uh, in this video as kind of a good analog and if, if you have a, you know, a blood clot that's stopping your heart, that's like a dam in the river that's, you know, not letting your blood to get through, which is a huge problem. We need to remove those, but we can't not pay attention to also the things that cause strokes, which is the little blood vessels of those little rivers that are going up that a lot of our roads are crossing over and causing um, lots of problems with. You'll see a picture behind me here. Um, that looks really pixelated because it's uh, representing the 25,000 road stream crossings we have in the state and just under half of them are a problem for some species or another to get to its spawning habitat. So I'm going to fly that flag here and then I'll, I'll pass this along uh, to, to Mike to uh, introduce himself and then happy to answer any questions you have and thanks for having me. Thank you Ben. Mike can you unmute yourself? Mike is on location. Okay, so yeah, I'm uh, Michael Shaughnessy. I'm president of the Friends of the Presumpscot River, and it's the river that wraps around Portland, goes through Westbrook, and comes out of Sebago Lake. And we're an all volunteer organization, and our goal is the restoration of the river. Um, and we've been working for the last 23 years on dam removal. We first entered into getting FERC licenses 23 years ago and now are, are seeing at this site here, which I'll turn this around so you can see is Sacarapa, where they're removing a, a series of dams here, which will then restore uh, five and a half miles plus tributaries up from that. And it's, it's uh, quite a, a um, moment for this river which has been dammed for starting in the early 1700s and then with the concrete headwalls that we usually recognize um, back from around the turn of the last century. Um, we've actually had in this river, I'm going to give you a little view of the river, hold on a second, if I can turn this around. I'm going all over the place. Okay. So this is the Presumpscot up here at the head of the Sacarapa Falls. Looking down here is through the western channel that is being worked on. There's an island in the middle, and this is the Dana Warp Mill over here. And uh, this ad flushed with salmon, shad, alewives, um, eels, lamprey, sturgeon. And there was actually a species of fish here, the Pajumscot jumper, which is a landlocked salmon that was extinct last seen around 1910, I believe. And so this is uh, kind of had a similar fate that lots of other rivers have had. But I think one of the beautiful things is that, that uh, through the kind of diligent work of the friends and our intrepid legal team, we have really made some major changes and we're seeing people turn around and, and embrace the river where they turned their backs on it for many, many years. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a note of hope, hopefulness when we don't see that much. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Jess or, or Meg, did you have any questions show up? We did come up with some questions to help sort of get the conversation going. World Fish Migration Day was supposed to be a week ago, but and I know that it's been rescheduled to October 24th. Um, so do you plan to talk about this later or do you wanna talk about this now? Like what's going on and um, what's happening around that? So the world is trying to figure it out. 
uh, events have, did take place on the 16th. We had the global webinar, <clears throat> which had um, um, a thousand people registered for it um, cool. in uh, every every continent with with the uh, river free flowing rivers. No Antarcticans on this uh, call, but um, that was an, that was amazing. And and there are other global events that have been taken place. There's a Eurovision, which is a takeoff of Eurovision, which is people singing songs about fish, and it's been incredible. So those videos and there's a lot of music videos, many of them quite professionally done, are coming out with some homemade songs on fish. And there's a drawing contest which just finished up, and and um, you can see some of the winners, uh, children from around the world, really all over the place that that submitted their their drawings. We got one. 1,200 drawings from kids in the Ukraine alone. Um, so super exciting stuff is still happening. For October, um, we're still planning on having some kind of event for the North America Hub, which is taking place in Plymouth, Mass, in the year of their 400th commemoration of the landing of the pilgrims there. So the pilgrims landed because there were these open fields around the mouth of what we call Town Brook. I don't know what they called it. And that brook is finally free flowing again after it was dammed within years of settlement there. And so working with the Wampanoag tribe, the Nature Conservancy, NOAA, and tons of volunteers, and especially the town of Plymouth, that is free flowing again and now has, a, has a, all kinds of um, eel passage as well as river heron passage. So things are happening. We don't know what the events are gonna be. We think it's probably not gonna be a live event for the hubs in October. I'm not sure it'll be safe yet. So we're trying to figure out now, we have a call tomorrow with the North America hub team to really um, fine tune what we're gonna do. Um, but there are some really creative things other people are doing online. So good question, thanks. Sure, thanks. So I don't see any questions in the chat box. I might be the one who's hogging all of those questions. Okay, great. They might have gone just to me. But um, one question I wanted to ask was the, the movie, or the film, excuse me, really focused on um, dams, but I was wondering if maybe Ben could talk about other impediments to fish, fish migration. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so I, I alluded to it a little bit in my introduction there, but um, we, uh, dams are the really obvious um, blockages to fish passage and certainly are, are some of the most major issues. You, you can't really restore a river without thinking about um, how you're going to get fish uh, both upstream and downstream um, um, the, of those dams, as well as uh, the other things that are a little bit uh, harder to understand, like sediment flows that came up a lot, which are a really important piece of this. Um, but it, in addition to that, there's also um, you know, 20, 25,000 in, in just Maine alone road stream crossings, and I, I think I already said this, but about half of them are some barrier to fish passage, and they're just as critical to address as those big obvious dams that you see um, down near head of tide ac across the state of Maine. You can, you know, drive right along the fall line on the state of Maine and see um, several you know, several dams that are, are big problems for fish passage. Um, but every time you drive your car over a road, over a stream, where the road goes over the stream, almost half of them are, are is just as much a problem for fish uh, moving from, from where they need to, uh, um, where they're living to where they need to spawn, where they need to have their babies. Um, so it's really important for us to, to think about that too. And one of the things that I, I get really excited about with this stuff is that almost all of the time when you have a problem for fish passage, when you've got a culvert that is just too small and water velocity is pumping through there really fast so that a fish can't swim through it and get upstream, those are also problems for people because those culverts are the ones that blow out when you have a big storm event. So we can solve both of those problems at the same time. And, and that's super exciting because it's, it's a problem where we can, we can have a, a really um, positive impact on both um, uh, public safety so that people don't have have dangerous uh, you know roads out there as well as solving the ecological issues thanks Ben um, and there's a question for Michael Michael could you talk about the connection between your work in the river and the city of Westbrook well this the city of Westbrook had um, was really for so long dominated by industries. We're looking at the Dana Warp Mill here. And 
the river was seen as basically it was a, a way of moving waste down. It was a way of having power. Originally, the dams here were a way of both having power and basically starving out the people that lived on the river. Chief Poulin, the Abenaki, that really is, this is their lands. And they made a, an amazing statement in saying Chief Poulin uh, in the 1730s introduced himself to the governor of, of the Massachusetts colony saying, I am Poulin and it's the Presumpscot River I belong to. And there is this, this shift where the people lived with the river and then there were of the river and then the people, the English settlers owned the river. And at that point in time, the river was just a means for their own economic gain. And now it's really coming back in the sense that they are, everybody is seeing the river as the sort of lifeblood of the community. And they're seeing their fate, the, the, the prosperity of the community tied to it. There's two. There's a huge set of waterfalls here at Sakurapa. There's another one at Cumberland Mills. The fish have come back. Last year, we had 52,000 alewife coming back from a high of 15,000 the year before. And so the, the, the whole city is really turning towards the river in ways that it never has before and linking it to both their kind of human health, but also economic health as well. Thank you, Michael. So there's a question in the chat from someone who wants to know if dams are ever good, and then also how can we be heard to deny dams or to um, to make a movement against some of the proposals for new dams? So if you could answer that and maybe speak to other things that folks can do to help raise awareness about their impact. Sure, well, I'll jump in. Um, the, I think one of the things to realize with um, with the construction of dams, especially a lot of talk now of creating new small hydro and putting turbines in old dams that were no longer serving their original functions is that economics usually don't work. The amount of power you produce for the amount of environmental destruction you do um, doesn't balance out. There's the maintenance of the dam. You may be required to put in fish passage um, and, and the, economics over time for maintenance and all this don't balance with the amount of power that you're going to produce. So it's a, it's, it's not a good balance in that way. Um, are there places where you could put dams where it would have less environmental damage? There certainly are. And that's something we've worked on in Maine. Developing tools is actually a pretty brilliant modeler in our office, Eric Martin, who's developed algorithms for putting in, you know, dozens of different metrics for decision making based on um, the economics of power production, the economics of job creation and building the dam, the economics of lost fish, the economics of drowned uh, cultural sites. Um, maybe it's not economics, maybe it's just uh, trying to put a value or ranking on uh, the spiritual importance of places as well as fish and fish passage and the protein that that provides to communities. So when you put all these into a matrix, it really helps you analyze a variety of dam sites, for instance, the entire country of Gabon, where you can look at, I think there are maybe 18 different parameters. Ben's a little more familiar than this model than I am, but you could actually see where um, by just, for instance, sacrificing 30% of the hydropower potential could give you another 45% of the ecological value. So Dams are always bad for rivers, I have to say that. However, if there must be dams in rivers, there are places that can damage fewer cultural, ecological, and economic opportunities. That's, that's absolutely spot on. I mean, there, there's, you know, I don't think anyone thinks that there are not some uh, instances where hydropower is really a good solution, but it really needs to be thought about very carefully and really contextualized in what's going on in that ecological system. Um, to the other part of that question, um, people were asking what they can do um, to sort of insert themselves in this process. And there is, at least in, in the states, 
Um, for hydropower licensed dams, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is really the governing body that decides whether or not a dam has to um, accommodate for fish passage, whether or not that's removing the dam completely or putting in a fishway. And anyone is uh, welcome as, as a, a member of the public to write letters to the Federal en Energy Regulatory Commission and state their opinions and conduct their own studies, commission their own studies. There's a, a wide variety of ways to insert yourself in that process. So if you're interested in that, um, please uh, reach out to them. Um, it matters a lot, a lot more than you might think to just have one letter that says, I'm really concerned that um, the, the brook trout that I'm fishing for are gonna get wiped out if you put this dam in or you don't put a fish away here. Um, and, and that um, the uh, regulators on that side, they need those letters to be able to take to their bosses and say, somebody has a concern here, we need to address this. If nobody writes those letters, which happens quite a lot, then they don't have any way of saying, we shouldn't uh, put this dam in or we need to accommodate for fish passage here. So please insert yourself in the process that way. The public has a ton of power in that and it's it's kind of obscure that there is that power when there's there's a warning when they have a, a hydro relicensing they put it out in the paper and anyone can write a letter and the more letters that we have for people saying that they care about migratory fish the more power that we have to actually uh, have some action happen at those dams if i could jump in on that um dams are also licensed from 30 to 50 years so you have to know what that timing is when those dams are licensed and um, and it's generational. So, you know, you have to get there when you can and, and turn out they are required to have public hearings and things of that nature. That makes a big difference as well. And so um, you don't underestimate what, you know, a few people could do well organized. We got five dams for, through the FERC process many years ago um, around the turn of this century. And um, it's a long process. It's um a lot of paperwork and we had five consecutive dams that went um that we got fish passage on we wanted three of them taken off two of them with fish passage we ended up getting fish passage for all of them it wasn't quite what we wanted but it was it was good and it's what led to what we have here there's also state statutes that say if you have a dam that has fish could pass basically that you could apply through that to get a dam to have fish passage as well so that's another on the state level there's ways of working and just real quick um the numbers aren't perfect in my head but roughly around 150 to 200 dams and josh correct me if i'm wrong are coming up for FERC relicensing in the next five years in the northeast so now's the time to really get in front of that and that that too those are the FERC. those are the hydro dams yes FERC has jurisdiction the non-hydro dams, which there are a number of as well, is state jurisdiction. Yeah. And they are, they're not on the same license schedule. So I have a little of sort of a palate cleanser of a question. And I'm wondering if you could tell us about your favorite fish and also where folks can go, um, you know, in the greater Portland area and Maine in general, if they want to see fish migration or fish ladders, things like that. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. Go okay, go for it. Sorry, just real quick, because my favorite fish is far and away the brook trout. And I'm not telling anybody where they can go see them when they're migrating because I'm going to catch them. So we'll just leave it there. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> my favorite fish is the one that's that gave it itself up for the team is in the talons of the eagle as it flies through downtown. I love that fish. <laughs> um, so my favorite fish is a uh, right above me in my virtual background, the sea lamprey, um, which has just incredible importance for the ecology of our streams. It's got a fascinating life history where it's a filter feeder in the gravel for six, seven, eight, nine years. It uh, it's, uh, swims to the ocean. We don't know how long it's out there, um, but they uh, all the adults die after they spawn. So they're adding, a, it's a constant source of nutrients into streams. They build nests, which are used by all sorts of species, probably including salmon, and their nutrients from all these dead adults every year after they spawn feeds whole ecosystems. So <clears throat> I love those. And, and the place to see spawning um, sea lamprey, where they're nest building, is really now through the early part of June. Streams like Sejunkidunk is a place I like to go, where there's been a lot of the studies. <clears throat> Nearby is um, 
Blackman Stream in the Leonard's Mill Logging Museum. That's a great place to see a fishway that was built there by the Atlantic Salmon Federation, uh, the Leonard's Mill Logging Museum and the Nature Conservancy <laughs> contributing to that. One of the great places I like to view is in Michael's backyard. It's a uh, Mill Brook and there's a preserve yep. there by the Presumpscot Valley Land Trust. I think it's called the Mill Brook Preserve. Mill Brook, yep. And uh, there's a trail that goes down, crosses the stream. You go downstream and there's a ledge drop and the fish pile up there and um, they're gonna be piling up in huge numbers. Um, two days ago, I was in Benton Falls on the Kennebec River where I've never seen so many fish all at once. And I've been looking at these fish runs uh, with great detail since about 2007. But they are packed in there um, so fast they can, can hardly lift them quick. They cannot lift them up the lift elevator quick enough. But you can sign a waiver and look in the viewing station and look at the top of the lift mm -hmm. and also walk downstream across the meadows to the river edge and see them migrating there by the, by the thousands. Damariscotta Mills is not going to be open because it's got these narrow boardwalks, as many people know who have been there. But um, now would be the time to go there. I think you can still see them from the bridge. Um, but a place you should go is on uh, Maine River's website. They have the 2019 Alewife Trail Map, and that shows sites up and down the coast from, uh, you know, all the way from uh, the Cherry Field runs to uh, down in, uh, in Cape and, and Presumpscot River. So please check that out on the MaineRivers.org website. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, actually, there was a question um, in the chat. In the film, there was a digital rendering of a fish passage where fish were trapped, lifted by crane, and then transported by a tank in a vehicle. The design seemed a bit extreme. What factors would render a geological design ill-effective or unpractical? I don't know if I could answer that completely. That's called trap and truck and it would oftentimes be used in locations where they couldn't actually put in a fish ladder or another variety might be mechanical fish ladder um, and so and sometimes it's used on a temporary basis while they're constructing something so it's uh i don't know so much about the geologic nature but but the circumstances of the of the dam may dictate whether or not you have to use something of that nature. Or, or more dams upstream, like on the Kennebec, where you could lift them up the dam in, in right there in Waterville, the first dam on the main stem river, but they would just run into another dam in another few miles. And you lift them up that, they'd make it wow. five miles to the next dam. Then they'd make it to Skowhegan and there'd be another dam. So um, that's a case where they lift them and they truck them up to the Sandy River, um, where there's incredible spawning ground in a place where um, if you want to see adult salmon spawning, that's some of, some of the best habitat um, in Maine uh, outside of the Penobscot. And I think you could put the Naraguegas and the East Machias in those top categories, but um, it's, a, it's, it's not something, it's expensive to do, it's, it's difficult to maintain, they aren't often maintained right. When I was at Benton Falls, which again I encourage people to go to, they had to balance how much water was coming in to attract fish to the opening versus too many fish crowding in and then using up the oxygen and dying. So they'd increase the volume of water going through, drive fish out, just so there'd be few enough fish being lifted at a time. There's many fish ways that don't estimate correctly how many fish are gonna come back. Um, we had no idea there were gonna be six million fish going up the, uh, the Sebastocook River. And I think that fishway was designed for one tenth of that amount of fish. So it's difficult, it's expensive. And, um, and yes, I think if, if part of your reaction is that that diagram was sort of absurd, they exist like that and they are absurd sometimes. And uh, it's the best that engineers can come up with and they're never ever perfect. I have to say that, and, and it I've met some really good engineers and there are some really good engineers out there, but no engineer can mimic what a river does um, naturally. So the perfect situation is to have the river flowing naturally, but according to the different pressures on, on those dams, sometimes that's the best option you have. And certainly that's a better option than nothing. So if you go to Howland, Maine, just a mile off the turnpike, if you're heading up towards Millinocket, um, 
there's a bypass that, that we in the Atlantic Salmon Federation and the other the Penobscot Indian Nation, the other, other members of the Penobscot River Restoration Trust um, funded and constructed this, this nature-like fishway around the dam. So it really looks like a large river. The fish use it just like a river. We've got tags and fish. They go up and downstream um, without mortality, which you will see mortality when they flip over dams going downstream or they're, or they're struggling to go upstream. So a nature-like fishway is better. Um, in, in this case, it works pretty darn good for every species we, we've tracked. Um, you touched on this a little bit with the writing letters um, regarding some of the dam permits, but what else can we do individually and then also as a society to help restore rivers? One of the, one of the things I, I think I always say to people is fall in love with the river. And the more you could connect to it and understand it and get people to connect to it, you know, you, once you connect to them, you start to be very passionate about it. And when that passion is shared and people collectively have, you know, are very conscientious about them, you know, I think that's the first step is don't take it, to, don't take the river for granted um, as we oftentimes have through an industrialized society. But, but to get out on it, in it, listen to it, go down early in the morning when everything is moving around and, and really get to know it. And, from there, you'll find a way to protect it. And Michael's hitting on a point that we've made numerous times in the uh, um, uh, conferences that I've been to, that none of this work can get done if you don't have local people who care about their rivers. I can, we can talk, Josh and I can talk about the importance of this writ large across the globe and how important it is to feed people and all these other things. Um, but if you don't have people that understand what the issue is and are willing to go uh, raise it in their community and educate um, their, their community members and try to come up with a solution, it, it just doesn't happen. Um, and so, it, you know, exactly to Michael's point, just to get out there, understand what the resources that you have, try to understand where the problems are, and advocate for them uh, with your neighbors, with your, your town council, and, 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 you know, call people like Josh and I and, and people like Landis Hudson from American Rivers and, and the other organizations that are doing this. We're certainly not the only people, and, and Michael, for sure. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you guys that the first thing to do is to to evoke that inspiration, get people excited, get them enthused. I think once you see a mass migration of fish like this, um, we don't have passenger pigeons anymore. It's a long drive to see wildebeest migrating, but we can see fish migrating by the millions. And when you see even thousands of fish darkening the river from one bank to another, it's inspiring. So one is inspiration. Two is educate yourself. No good democracy works without people educating themselves, understanding the data and being able to use it, and then become an advocate in your town, your state. As Ben mentioned the FERC process, which has so few people participating. And then there's funding, support local groups like your local land trust, your friends groups, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Atlantic Salmon Federation. There's groups around the state and around the world that are trying to fix rivers. It's expensive and sometimes those private dollars leverage a lot of state and federal dollars that we might not otherwise be able to get without showing that sort of local support. So inspire, educate yourself, become a good advocate. You can also become a citizen scientist and help out at fish counts. There's a fish counts at Highland Lake and Quasset. There, there's a fish counts in the East Machias River. Um, if you can't get out or you're not mobile or you you're really need to isolate yourself, you can be a virtual scientist and go to uh, the Plymouth um, website, town of Plymouth, Massachusetts. You can download a segment of Fishway video. I think it's 15 seconds and do your count of that segment. And then if you're excited to try another count, you do that. If enough people get the same count for that segment of film, then that goes into the record as the official count. Um, <laughs> We're also working with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute on a web app that you can access through your phone or tablet um, for monitoring sea run fish. So we're starting with Tom Cod and Smelt in Eastern Maine and Mid Coast Conservancy and Mary Meeting Bay, sorry, Kennebec Estuary Land Trust are helping to figure out how we can expand the citizen science 
statewide that people can get out, go to your streams and get these counts efficient, add to the record, which informs management, lets us know about climate change and population increases and decreases, and can also guide management and restoration. So that's my pitch. Can I add one thing really quick sure. too? Um, I want to kind of give a shout out because he's out there. There's a, a guy who just picks up trash named John Chandler, who's been picking up trash by the ton full out of the lower Presumpscot. That helps too. Just go out and clean it up too. Thanks. Nice. And I have a sort of shameless self-promotion. Um, as the science and technology librarian, I try to keep a up-to-date citizen science webpage and we periodically will send out opportunities in our social media or um, you know it, or uh, in our newsletter to get people excited so if you're looking for a resource um, we do have that at the library awesome thank you so much thank you josh and ben and michael for joining us tonight, taking the time to prepare for this and, and spending your evening with us, telling us about this really exciting project. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I'm gonna follow the World Fish Migration website to see, you know, what are some interesting, you know, ways that we could participate. I'd love seeing those videos of, I mean, it, you know, we probably won't have those amazing parades, but there may be opportunities to build paper mache fish and hang them from our front door or, you know, yeah, right. So things like that, there might be, you know, and school will be back in session in some way, shape or form. So there may be ways for, for kids who are maybe spending less time in the classroom to be involved um, in their own way. So anyway, I'm, I'm excited um, and I'm really, um, I'm just really happy that we had this opportunity to be together and, and thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, thank, you. Uh, we'll, thank you, everybody. We'll be back in um, a couple of weeks, I think in June, so stay tuned. We'll uh, have the announcement about our next series topic on the fourth Wednesday of June. Um, and yeah, be well, be safe and um, enjoy the rest of the evening. And thanks again, thanks Meg. Yeah, thank Bye. you everyone, thank this you. was great. Take care. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone.